Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockets OGTV. My name is Jim Jacobson. I'm the goat, the voice in your ears and the image in your eyes. If you're looking in the up hand, upper right hand side of the screen, um, you're, you're on Grocket.com, and we are doing the 12th edition to the Guide to the GMAT done by the makers of the test, the Graduate Management Admissions Council, and we're going through all of the problems in that book uh, one by one, step by step. <clears throat> and last time uh, we, we started the reading comprehension section, so we are now on page, with a brand new passage, we are on page uh, 362, and we are on question number uh, 9. And so as before, what I'm going to allow you to do is uh, have that time, that initial time, and this is a longer passage, it's uh, six paragraphs long, um, and it also has, what, nine questions? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, nine questions on it. So um, this is one where it's absolutely in your best interest to read this one pretty well and thoroughly. If we read it thoroughly, we can get through the, the uh, questions that much more quickly because we're familiar with the passage. So I'll give you four, four and a half minutes to read the passage, take notes. I, too, will be taking notes on the passage, and then we'll hit the questions. So um, let's get started.
Okay, that's probably good enough. I don't want to spend all day uh, reading. But as I mentioned last time, um, in your own practice, if you find that I am not spending or I'm not giving you enough time to read the passages well, um, just pause the broadcast. Um, eventually, uh, th these broadcasts won't aren't up yet. I, I, I found out. Sorry, I mentioned that last time. Um, <clears throat> these broadcasts aren't up yet, but eventually they will be up uh, and available for watching uh, later. So um, when you're watching these videos, you can pause the broadcast at the point where I give you time to read passages and um, take all the time that you want because untimed practice is as important as timed practice in terms of uh, getting your skills up. Anyway, um, so a passage about this dramatic solution to a problem in archaeology and let's see what we have in the questions now that we've read it thoroughly. And again, um, as I mentioned before, the notes I take are going to be more thorough than what you would probably even want to take, or, and more thorough than what I would take even on the GMAT, because I want you to be able to read my notes. Um, but you get the, the general idea of what sorts of things I've chosen to write down. Anyway, uh, question number nine. The primary purpose of the passage is to propose. Okay, so... Um, you know, as I mentioned before, it is in your best interest to know whether the artist is advocating a particular course of action or simply explaining something. Uh, in this question, it's built in that the that the author is is proposing something or advocating a course of action. So that little step doesn't help as much in this particular case. And uh, primary purpose questions or main idea questions ask uh, ask us to capture the overall um, the overall passage, not just details from it. So choice A, an alternative to museum display of artifacts. And I think um, it certainly is an alternative approach. And if we only read the first two words, that would be tempting. On the other hand, um, it's not an alternative to display, uh, or I suppose it is, but they already have an alternative to display, which is namely storage. So that doesn't really capture exactly what this one is about. So display is the problem here. So it's not that one. And I'm going to try crossing them off on the side so that I can uh, erase what I write here and um, uh, keep the notes on the screen. So, uh, so uh, question, or answer choice B, a way to curb illegal digging while benefiting the archaeological profession. Well, that, that sounds good um, because it does talk about both illegal digging and benefiting the profession, but let's keep going. Uh, C, a way to distinguish artifacts with scientific value from those that have no such value. There is no way to distinguish, per se, um, mentioned in the passage, other than perhaps sheer numbers. It sounds like they're, you know, with thousands of this and thousands of that, um, that's part of, what, part of what's, uh, what's a factor, but that's not what, what's going on. Um, D, the governmental regulation of archaeological sites. There's no um, no talk of the government regulating archaeological sites in there, so that's not it at all. And E, a new system for cataloging. Again, uh, it does mention that if they were selling these artifacts, there would be money to catalog these items before sale, but that's not it either. So that leaves us with answer choice B as our correct answer. It's a way to curb illegal digging while benefiting the archaeological profession. And then there's some details and some further thinking on that particular point. So number nine is B. And now I'm going to try doing this so I can leave my notes up. This isn't actually in a race. This is just white, quote unquote, ink, white e-ink. So if I were to just scribble all over the place, I would delete my answer choices. So I have to be a little bit more careful. Anyway, all right, number 10. It worked. The author implies that all of the following statements about duplicate artifacts are true except. Now with these except questions, uh, these are by definition much more time consuming and also a little bit trickier. Every one of these answer choices except one will be something that appeared in the passage. So you'll read things and you'll say, oh yeah, that I totally remember seeing that. Oh wait, that means it's not the right answer choice. So that can be a little bit frustrating. And it, it really, there's really no way around it other than going answer by answer. So um, number or uh, answer choice A, a market for such artifacts already exists. We're talking about duplicate um, artifacts. Um, 
and really it's um, pretty early on uh, you know we find out that there is um, a great deal of market for these artifacts both at the very beginning of the passage where we hear about illegal sale going on um, and then also the entire um, uh, fifth paragraph is about selling these duplicate artifacts so um, there's two places where we find out that this is true according to the author so because it's something that is mentioned by the author and is true it's not the answer um, B such artifacts seldom have scientific value we find out about scientific value in um, Well, it's between the end of the third paragraph and the fourth paragraph. The author transitions from talking about how there are that how the author feels there are some artifacts that don't have scientific value, and then goes on to mention these certain types of artifact artifacts where there are thousands and thousands of them. So that section um, talks about how there are some artifacts without particular scientific value. So that is covered by the author. Um, and again, these are implications. Um, you know, where, where the author will almost say it, but not quite. Uh, C, there is likely to be a continuing supply of such artifacts. So the author does actually imply that um, in lines 41 through 43, where the author says, the basements of museums are simply not large enough to store the artifacts that are likely to be discovered in the future. So even though, you know, the author doesn't say outright that there is likely to be a, con a continuing supply the author almost says that, so that's also implied. Uh, D, museums are well supplied with examples of such artifacts. Again, we have the, um, in the, in line 43, we have there's not enough money to catalog the finds, so they have plenty going on. And then also in, uh, where is that? L lines like 48 and 49, it says, uh, Artifacts could be more accessible than are the pieces stored in bulging museum basements. Bulging museum basements makes it sound like they have a lot of this stuff already. So um, it's implied that the museums are well supplied, unless they have really tiny basements, which there's no support for that in the passage, nor is it very likely. You would have a terrible museum if you had a tiny basement. Um, choice E, of course, is the only one that's left, but let's double check it to make sure we didn't miss something. Such artifacts frequently exceed in quality those already cataloged in museum collections. So um, there's nothing at all about the relative quality about these artifacts. Um, in fact, the author implies that one is basically about the same as another. Um, it says in line 30... Three, starting in line 33, I refer to the thousands of pottery vessels and ancient lamps that are essentially duplicates of one another. Um, and so um, if they're essentially duplicates, some of these artifacts cannot be of much greater quality than, than each other, so um, this is not something that the author implies. And that's it, answer choice E. Okay. Question number 11, still on page, oh, this is page 363, I'm sorry. If you had your page open to 262, you also had it open to 263, but I still feel bad. All right, 363, number 11. Which of the following is mentioned in the passage as a disadvantage of storing artifacts in museum basements? So we find out about museum basements in um, basically the fifth and sixth paragraph, where, where we find out that they have way too many of these things in their basements. Um, they don't have the money to catalog them and no one can see them when they're in the basement. So the answer choice will be something like that. Um, a, museum officials rarely allow scholars access to such artifacts. Well, we don't hear that. We do find out that, of course, people can't see them. They're not as accessible. It does say, um, Sold artifacts could be more accessible than are the pieces stored in bulging museum basements. But just because they're more accessible doesn't mean that the ones in the basements are not accessible. So this is not it. Um, space that could better be used for display is taken up for storage. Um, no, uh, we're not talking about relative 
uh, space usage in museums at all, just that they have a lot of stuff in storage, period. And I think basements um, are kind of a, um, what's the word? I think the technical literary term is uh, metonymy or something like that, where you're using one part for another. Not all the art is necessarily stored in, in the museum basement per se. It could be in a warehouse on the other side of town. Um, and that, of course, would make it not well suited to display. So um, anyway, it's not that. Um, so choice C, artifacts discovered in one excavation often become separated from each other. So that may be something where someone with, if, if any of you listening right now have outside knowledge of archaeology, maybe that happens. I don't know. I've never really gone on a dig or anything like that. Maybe that happens, but that's not what happens in the passage. So it's not that. Uh, D, such artifacts are often damaged by variations in temperature and humidity. Like, this is totally an outside knowledge one. This is true. Many um, objects recovered from archaeological digs have been damaged by um, being in a different environment from where they were found, but that's not in the passage either. So that leaves us again with E, and we should read it anyway. Such artifacts often remain uncatalogued and thus cannot be located once they are put in storage. Um, And that's what it actually says. There is not enough money to even catalog the, catalog the finds. As a result, they cannot be found again and become as inaccessible as if they had never been discovered. And this is actually true, too. I mean, aside from it being in the passage, every once in a while, somebody finds something in a museum basement, and they're like, holy cow, this is amazing. Why, why didn't anybody know what this was before? You know, because in 1837, when they found it, uh, they didn't know as much about what they were looking at. Anyway. So this is clearly the right answer, because that's mentioned explicitly in the passage in line 40, 1, 2, 3, 43 and following. And we are going to change pages, but not passages. Now, unlike the real GMAT, so in the real GMAT, you will have the, real, the, the passage always in front of you on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, Oh, we actually are changing past this. For some reason, I thought this was all the same one. Ha ha ha. Oops. Well, I can clear this then. All right. I will give you um, another. This one's a much shorter passage, so I'll give you, you know, three and a half, four minutes for this one. And this is page, whoops, page 364, uh, question number 12.
Okay, shorter passage and a little bit more straightforward. So, uh, but a lot of questions. We have uh, six questions on just those uh, three short paragraphs. So it'll be interesting to see how the how the GMAT does this. And of course, this is something that can happen um, at any time. Uh, the number of questions is not proportional to the length of the passage or even necessarily to the difficulty of the passage. They can give you challenging inference questions on an, a short and straightforward passage and give you um, a few pretty easy questions on a a longer or more challenging or more technological or more you know scientific or whatever whatever you find challenging um, the passage can be very hard and long and the questions can be easy so let's get going uh, question number 12 the passage is primarily concerned with which of the following so we are getting our main idea question first and primarily it was about what was mentioned uh, in our notes that uh, how we have an example of um, emphasizing the production and distribution of a product um, being more successful than simply being the first ones in the market and commercializing the new technology. So let's just see what the answer choices give us. Answer choice A, evaluating two competing technologies. Well, you know, beta and VHS, I guess you, you can think of them as different technologies, but there isn't really an evaluation of what made them different in terms of how the you know the information was recorded on tape or anything like that so uh, it's more an evaluation of the different business strategies rather than the technologies uh, B tracing the impact of a new technology by narrating a sequence of events um, there are some events that happen you know that this happened beta did this and VHS did this but it's definitely not about the impact of the technology. This isn't talking about how people stopped going to the theater because they could watch pre-recorded tapes at home or anything like that. So it's not tracing the impact of a new technology. Uh, C, reinterpreting an event from contemporary business history. Um, I don't think they're reinterpreting it. I think at the time even people knew what was going on with beta versus VHS. Um, I was there, and uh, it was certainly my <laughs> impression that uh, people knew what was going on. Uh, of course, that's outside knowledge, but the passage is not reinterpreting. It's not saying, well, people used to think this, but now they think this other thing. So it's not that. Uh, choice D, illustrating a business strategy by means of a case history. And so um, this here, paragraph one, is a business strategy. They're both business strategies, or the business strategy is choosing production and distribution over just being the first one to the market. Um, and then it explains how they went about that. And so it is kind of a case history. So D is awfully tempting. Let's just check E to be sure. Um, proposing an innovative approach to business planning. Ugh, no. no. So um, these two things, there's nothing that says that one or the other of these was a innovative new approach. Um, it was um, more about how Nowadays, in, in, current, in the current business environment, production and distribution um, has a better chance of being successful and giving a case study, but it's nothing about it being uh, innovative or anything like that. So that leaves us with answer choice D, uh, illustrating a business strategy by means of a case history. So still on page 364. I'm going to keep my notes on the side there. Question number 13. So according to the passage, today's successful firms, unlike successful firms in the past, may earn the greatest profits by. And again, that's this first paragraph where um, the global economy and the size of the economy have perhaps made it more possible to um, make money by simply being more successful in the production and distribution of a product. So the uh, answer is going to be something like that. So A, investing in research to produce cheaper versions of existing technology. So uh, we actually find out in um, line 21 and 22 that the VHS was neither technically better nor cheaper than the beta. So this is not about doing something uh, that's cheaper. Uh, B being the first to market a competing technology. It's actually the Betamax that was the first to the market and they were not successful. Yeah, and it was actually Sony. Sony was the beta company. Anyway, and they, they have gone on to be successful in other things, so it didn't kill them. 
Uh, but no, the first to market was not the um, the the today's successful firm example. Uh, C, adapting rapidly to a technological standard previously set by a competing firm. Um, so the VHS was not um, better than the beta, uh, and in fact, it was actually a little bit worse uh, quality-wise in terms of fidelity to the original recording. Again, that's outside knowledge, but in terms of the passage, it actually says that it was not technically better. So it, it actually didn't adapt to the standard of the beta. They didn't they didn't make something equally good. So, um, and there's nothing about adapting rapidly. There's no, so that's again, not in the passage. Uh, D, establishing technological leadership in order to shape product definitions in advance of competing firms. This is again, very similar to choice B where it's talking about being first to the market. Those are the advantages of being the first to the market. The successful business in our case study was not the first to the market, so it's not D either. Um, e, emphasizing the development of methods for the mass production and distribution of a new technology. Again, that's exactly what we predicted, that it was the pr something about production and distribution being better than being the first to the market. So it is answer choice E. And last one on this page, question number 14. According to the passage, consumers began to develop a preference for VCRs in the VHS format because they believed which the following. And it was the third paragraph that talked about consumers and consumer preferences and consumer perceptions. Um, and it's line 26. The perception among consumers that pre-recorded tapes were more available in VHS format further expanded VHS's share of the market. So it's going to have to have something to do with pre-recorded tapes. Let's take a look at our answers. Uh, a, VCRs in the VHS format were technically better than competing format VCRs. We already found out that VHS was not technically superior in that same paragraph. It's line 21 and following. That's not it. Uh, B, v VCRs in the VHS format were less expensive than competing format VCRs. Same sentence, it says they were neither technically better nor cheaper. It's not B. Uh, C, VHS was the first standard format for VHS. For VCRs. Also, we already know that VHS got to the market, or that beta got to the market first, so VHS was not that. Um, and, uh, and uh, nor is there anything about it being the consumer perception. So it is possible for consumers to have the perception of something that just isn't true, uh, but even that is not what's going on here. There's no evidence in the passage that consumers thought VHS was actually first. Um, D, uh, VHS pre recorded videotapes were more available than those in beta format. Um, that is what the passage actually says outright. Let's check um, E. E says VCRs in the beta format would soon cease to be produced. Um, that's definitely not mentioned in the passage. So it is in fact answer choice D. And from here we move on to the next page. our second half of the questions. So page 365, question number 15. The author implies that one way that VHS producers won control over the VCR market was. Um, and so the, the part where we find out about how VHS producers won control over the market is primarily in uh, the second paragraph where we, we, we are reminded that the producers of the VHS, um, they were more successful at uh, forming strategic alliances with producers and distributors um, to manufacture and market the, uh, the format. Yeah, that's basically it. That uh, VHS had more strategic alliances with, for both marketing and production. So it should be something like that. Um, so A, carefully restricting access to VCR technology. Later in that paragraph, we find out that this is what the uh, producers of the beta actually did. It says, um, beta producers were reluctant to form such alliances and eventually lost ground because they were seeking to maintain exclusive control over VCR distribution. So uh, it's actually, this applies to the wrong format. This is beta rather than VHS. Uh, choice B, giving up a slight early lead in VCR sales in order to improve long-term prospects. 
well, neither of them list that as an actual strategy that they give up a lead in order to improve long-term prospects. So that's not implied by the passage. C, retaining a strict monopoly on the production of pre-recorded videotapes. Now, if anything, that's not true because there was this notion of the pre-recorded videotapes um, or this perception of pre-recorded videotapes in VHS format being more widespread. Um, therefore, it is unlikely that they had a, a strict monopoly on its production, but there's also nothing about a strict monopoly on the production of the pre-recorded tapes, so not that. Um, D, sharing control of the marketing of VHS format VCRs. So that is implied where, in it set, where it says that they formed strategic alliances with other producers and distributors to manufacture and market their VCR format. So in forming strategic alliances, that means that they weren't doing it all themselves. That's the nature of alliances, right? So they did not have exclusive control of the marketing of the VHS format. Tempting answer choice. Um, let's check E. Sacrificing technological superiority over beta format VCRs in order to remain competitive in price. This one's clearly meant to tempt the business minds out there because, of course, um, you know, uh, competition in, in economics is uh, a big deal, and this is actually one of the ways that you get a competitive advantage. In fact, it's the main way, namely on price. Um, and uh, so, uh, but that's not mentioned at all in the passage. So while it says that they are not uh, technically better, it also says that they weren't cheaper. So they weren't really competing on price. It says that outright in the passage, so it can't be E. And it is, in fact, answer choice D. All right, number 16. The alignment of producers of VHS format VCRs with producers of pre-recorded videotapes is most similar to which of the following? Okay, so this is one of these uh, trickier and a little bit more rare questions. There, It's an application question where you're asked to apply a model from the passage to an outside situation. Um, kind of, and, and so the trick here is to kind of abstract um, in your mind as best you can by paraphrasing or however you want to do it, abstract the model in the passage so that you can more easily recognize it in an alien situation. We may be going from VCRs to flowers or something, and we just have no idea. Well, actually, just previewing the answer choices, they're all about automobile manufacturers, um, which makes it a little bit closer because, you know, we're talking about uh, VCR manufacturers, at least. Um, some of these application questions, all of the answer choices will be radically different kind of businesses and things like that. And so you really have to um, flex your ability to come up with a paraphrase of the model. Okay, so the thing we need to try and um, distill to a, a very basic expression is the alignment of producers of VHS format VCRs with producers of pre-recorded videotapes. So I guess we would think about that in terms of their flexibility. Um, there were multiple producers, um, and you know, because they allowed the, they had alliances in the manufacture of the VHS uh, VCRs, and they encouraged, they, they formed strategic alliances so that there would be a lot of pre-recorded videotapes out there. So. Um, yeah, I guess uh, thinking of it in terms of um, widely available, having multiple sources of pre-recorded videotapes, something along those lines. Having, or at least having the consumer perception of, their, of them being widely available. Um, right. So A, um, the alignment of an automobile manufacturer with another automobile manu manufacturer to adopt a standard design for automobile engines. So this would be if VHS and Beta had formed some kind of agreement. It's not an agreement between two manufacturers of the VCR. Uh, it's the manufacturer between the VCRs and the videotapes. So this is not it. Uh, B, the alignment of an automobile manufacturer with an automobile glass company, whereby the manufacturer agrees to purchase automobile windshields only from that one glass company. Um, so this, is, this would be more akin to perhaps the VHS people saying, uh, we will only get our the little rubber bands that are used to uh, turn the wheels that move the tapes around. We'll only get those from one company. Um, 
Once, once one set of those is in the machine, though, there isn't any sort of widespread input for it. Whereas these videotapes, there's many, many different videotapes, and they're exchangeable and can be put into the VCR and taken out. Um, so it's not a one-time transaction. It's an ongoing thing that you know consumers will purchase or rent these videotapes for the life of the VCR. Whereas with the windshield, you're only getting one. So it's not B. C. The alignment of an automobile manufacturer with a petroleum company to ensure the widespread availability of the fuel required by a new type of engine developed by the manufacturer. So this has that widespread availability that we were looking for, and it's a kind of input. It's not quite the same as a tape, though, uh, where you could put it in, take it out, and then get a different one. Um, but but the whole wide making sure that that this other thing that goes into it is is widely available is pretty close. So let's, you know, kind of keep this one and check the other ones. D, the alignment of an automobile manufacturer with its dealers to adopt a plan to improve automobile design. Okay, so there was nothing in there about, hey, how do we make VHS VCRs better? Totally not it. Um, e, the, I'm sick of reading about alignment automobiles and stuff. Okay, the alignment of an automobile dealer with an automobile rental chain to ad adopt a strategy for an advertising campaign to promote a new type of automobile. Well, that's a little bit tempting because, of course, having VHS pre-recorded videotapes available does indirectly market VHS VCRs. Um, but in this particular case, um, it's not anything about the making it appear widely available. Um, and this is this would be more uh, since they're actually talking about renting the automobile. This would be as if they were renting out VCRs. Um, those of you who were alive back then, if you were, uh, you actually could rent VCRs from video stores. Oftentimes, because some people just didn't have them, they were hundreds and hundreds of dollars when they first came out. Um, but uh, in this particular case, we have to keep our terminology clear. The automobile dealer is the, uh, or the automobile manufacturer is the VHS VCR people. An automobile dealer would be someone who sells VHS VCRs, and they're making a deal with somebody who rents out VCRs. So this, is, this kind of goes outside the scope of the deal between producers of VHS VCRs and producers of pre-recorded videotapes. So the one that we were thinking about originally, uh, with pre-recorded tapes being widely available and, pre and uh, petroleum fuel being widely available, um, choice C is our winner. These, uh, so this is obviously um, your thinking process is going to be much faster than uh, my talking process going through questions like this. Um, but you can see how, how important it is to kind of distill and abstract the uh, model from the passage because it, especially with one like this, where they use a lot of the same terminology in every answer choice, um, you really have to kind of track, well, this represents this in this model, and so then this is similar to this in this other way. Um, it's pretty tricky. Okay, last question on um, VHS versus beta. And of course, uh, almost nobody buys either of them anymore, but, well, nobody, well, almost nobody. Anyway, number 17. Which of the following best describes the relation of the first paragraph to the passage as a whole? So the first paragraph, going back to our notes, we remember was really just about commercializing new technology is maybe no longer as good as uh, being the person who, who uh, innovates in, in the production and distribution of that same type of product. So it's the, there's nothing about VHS versus beta in the first paragraph, it's kind of a general thing. Um, so A, it makes a general observation to be exemplified. Exemplified means to make an example of something. And we do have this example of VHS versus beta, so we'll keep this one, but we need to see what else there is. Um, it outlines a process to be analyzed. Well, I suppose you could think about uh, the production and distribution of stuff as a process, but it doesn't really analyze all the steps that VHS and beta took in the production and distribution. It's more kind of a, a rough sketch than an analysis, so I, B, I think we can eliminate. Uh, C, it poses a question to be answered. Um, no, and um, if anything, the original paragraph makes declarative statements. 
It says, today, however, the largest payoffs may go to companies that lead in developing integrated approaches for successful mass production and distribution. So that, there's no question there. Uh, D, it advances an argument to be disputed. Um, had the first paragraph said that, it would have said something like, many people think this, but it turns out that might not be true. Um, whereas it actually starts off by saying, um, nowadays it looks like this is what's true, and then they give an example. So it's not D. And E, it introduces conflicting arguments to be reconciled. No, there, there's no reconciliation of these two um, approaches. So that actually puts us right back with answer choice A. A general observation that production and distribution is probably better than commercializing a new technology. And then the example is VHS versus beta. So it's answer choice A. Okay. I think we are going to get through... Um, well, well, we'll see how far we get with our um, next paragraph, and we may get through all the questions. I'm not sure. Um, we'll see how it goes. So this is going to be page, uh, starting on page 366. Question number, well, actually, I should probably, the question itself will be on page 367, and it'll be question number 18. The passage is on page 366, and this is what I was starting to say before. This is what the one I was thinking of. Um, we actually will have to turn the page eventually to new questions, and the passage will no longer be on the left-hand side the way it would be on the GMAT. So we'll just have to be prepared to flip back and forth. Just know that that's coming. So I'll give you, you know, four minutes-ish. Yeah, you know, around four minutes to read this passage, and then we'll start going through the questions. I'll take notes.
Okay, that's a good place to stop. That's about four minutes. Let's uh, tackle some of these questions and see how much we can get done before the end of the broadcast. So the passage provides, uh, oh, so general, general passage idea here, the author is not advocating any particular course of action, just explaining about gravity and circulation and how that um, differs in snakes that are on land versus snakes that are in the sea. So the passage provides information in support of which of the following assertions. So here, um, there's really, I mean, there's no predicting, predicting we can do. We can't go to the passage and look for information in advance. We just have to look at the answer choices and see which one sounds right and has support in the passage. So A, uh, the disadvantages of an adaptation to a particular feature of an environment often outweigh the advantages of such an adaptation. Um, well, you know, there are disadvantages to each of the adaptations that they describe, you know, the different places that the hearts are in the different snakes. Um, but r really, the main disadvantages, I mean, it talks about how, how bad things get for sea snakes when you take them out of the water and hold them up so that their head is above their heart. Well, that's great, but how often does that happen to sea snakes? So um, it's not necessarily true that, that those disadvantages outweigh the advantages. In fact, they appear to do just fine until somebody takes them out of the water and tilts their heads up. So that can't be it. Um, B, an organism's reaction to being placed in an environment to which it is not well adapted can sometimes illustrate the problems that have been solved by the adaptations of organisms indigenous to that environment. Um, well, that's actually exactly what they do with sea snakes. They, they say, wow, okay, if you take sea snakes out and tilt their heads up, they are totally in bad shape. They lose all the blood circulation to their brain, um, which shows how well adapted they are to their environment. So this is, that's, that's pretty tempting. The passage does support this. And remember, this isn't the main idea. This is just which of these answer choices is something that the passage supports as a conclusion. Um, See, the effectiveness of an organism's adaptation to a particular feature of its environment can only be evaluated by examining the effectiveness with which organisms of other species have adapted to a similar feature of a different environment. Wow. Okay, so, um, so this would be saying that we can only evaluate how well a snake has adapted to its environment by looking at something else um, adapting to a similar feature of a different environment. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily true, and um, these are actually different environments with different features. So, you know, we actually have different pressure gradients in the, uh, just to use the term from the bit about sea snakes, it's talking about how the pressure is actually different in the ocean than it is in a tree, and uh, so it's not really a similar feature, so this is actually not what happens in the passage. It's a different environment with different features, not different environment with a similar feature. Uh, D, organisms of the same species that inhabit strikingly different environments will often adapt in remarkably similar ways to the few features of those environments that are common. Well, uh, no. Um, in fact, you know, having your heart in a completely different place in your body does not sound like a remarkably similar adaptation, so that's not good. E, different species of organisms living in the same environment will seldom adapt to features of that environment in the same way. Well, th this just isn't supported. I mean, we, we only have the two types of snakes that we talk about, so we can't say that what will generally happen, that they'll seldom adapt to features of that environment in the same way. So that leads us back to B, that basically taking a sea snake out of the sea uh, highlights just how well the snake has adapted to the sea, and then that's where choice B is basically the generalization of that specific example. So B for number 18. Number 19. According to the passage, one reason that the distribution of blood in the sea snake changes little while the creature remains in the ocean is that. So that's that thing with the pressure gradients. That's... Um, lines 11 and onward because the vertical pressure gradients within the blood vessels are counteracted by similar pressure gradients in the surrounding water. The distribution of blood throughout the body of sea snakes remains about the same regardless of their orientation in space provided they remain in the ocean. So that's what the passage says and since this is a detailed question it says according to the passage we are going to need specific passage citations to support our answer. Um, so A 
The heart of the sea snake tends to be located near the center of the body. Um, so that is mentioned in the passage, uh, but that's not the, 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 it's not mentioned in the part of the passage where we find out about the distribution in the, of the blood and the sea snake changing. So it's not that. Uh, B, pressure gradients in the water surrounding the sea snake counter the effects of vertical pressure gradients within its blood vessels. That's almost exactly what I read, so this, is, this has got to be it. We'll cover the remaining ones quickly. Um, because again, it is important to know how wrong answer choices are constructed so that you can identify them more readily. Uh, C, the sea snake assumes a vertical posture um, less frequently than do terrestrial and the arboreal snake. Arboreal just means tree, tree, tree snakes, so tree snakes. Um, uh, no, uh, there's no, there's no reason to assume that and because in fact it says that their blood pressure or the pressure gradients or whatever remain the same regardless of their relative position. So sea snakes, if they're in the ocean, can be as vertical as often as they want, and you know it suggests that they're basically fine. So um, there's no reason to assume that this is true. Um, there's no basis for it. In fact, it's kind of contradicted. D, the sea snake often relies on waves of muscle contractions to help move blood from the torso to the head. Um, that could be true, although actually the whole uh, torso wiggling thing is actually about ar arboreal or tree snakes. So that's not really supported. And then E, the force of pressure gradients in the water surrounding the sea snake exceeds that of, of the vertical pressure gradients within its circulatory system. This sounds very like what's in the passage. And this is the one meant to capture people who are skimming rather than reading carefully. It does not exceed the um, vertical pressure gradients. It is It just simply counteracts them. So this is the extreme, you know, or maybe it's not extreme. I guess it, it's it's a, a very similar thing that goes beyond what the passage actually says, and it's meant to capture people who aren't reading very carefully. So answer choice B is our correct one. And, oops, sorry, word question. I erased part of you. Um, question number 20. It can be inferred from the passage that which of the following is true of species of terrestrial snakes that often need to assume a vertical posture. So terrestrial snakes are um, starting really in paragraph three. And uh, since we have to infer this, we kind of have to look at the answer choices first before we can make our inferences. Um, A, they are more likely to be susceptible to circulatory failure in vertical postures than are sea snakes. Um, that's actually the reverse. It's sea snakes that have the big problem with vertical posture. So it's not A. B, their hearts are less likely to be located at the midpoint of their bodies than is the case with the sea snakes. Well, that's my little note here. I illustrated, maybe I should have, I guess I could have done this in red. I could have made these little hearts red. Um, the, uh, the land snake has its head closer to its heart than the sea snake does. So it is, um, that is in fact the case. Their hearts are less likely to be located at the midpoints of their body than is the case with sea snakes. So that actually sounds great. We'll keep it and double check the others. Uh, they cannot counteract the pooling of blood in lower regions of their bodies as effectively as sea snakes can. Um, well, that's what that whole uh, snake wiggling thing is at the uh, end of the third paragraph, that they have a means of kind of forcing the blood back up. So they do okay. It's not that. Um, so it's not that they cannot counteract it. They have a mechanism for doing so. D, the blood pressure at their midpoint decreases significantly when they are tilted with their heads up. What? I mean, that's nobody, that's not even close to anything in the passage. Well, it's close. It, words like that are used in the passage, but that's, that's Martians came down from outer space and supplied answer choice D for us. Um, choice E, they are unable to rely on muscle contractions to move venous blood from the, uh, venous means in veins, um, to move uh, venous blood from the lower torso to the head. Well, it actually says outright that they can do that. So this is contradicted by the passage giving us answer choice B as the answer. Okay, well, I hate to do this, but I think we need to stop in the middle of the passage. There are another um, five questions about our different types of snakes for next time. So um, I think next time I will just assume that everyone has read the passage and we will just dive right into the questions in the next broadcast.
just to make sure that we get through stuff. So anyway, um, again, my name is Jim Jacobson. You've been listening to me talk about uh, sea snakes, Betamax, and archaeological theft. And uh, next time we will talk more about sea snakes, as well as probably a couple other topics. So um, you've been watching Grocket.com's uh, OG TV, and the OG stands for Official Guide. In this particular case, it's the 12th edition of the Guide to the GMAT. So, see you next time.